Good morning and welcome to our Sunday morning service online at Holyrood Evangelical Church. We're delighted that you've chosen to join us and we trust and pray that you'll be blessed as we worship the Lord together. And a special welcome if you're a visitor. Uh, if this is your first time, uh, a special welcome to you. If you want to find out more about the church, uh, you can do that through our website. Uh, and there's a page on that in which you can contact us and we'll get back in touch with you. And we'll be delighted to do that if you want to know more about us. This morning our guest preacher is Harry Clayson, who's returning for the fifth time to complete the series on the I Am sayings of Jesus from John's Gospel. And we look forward eagerly to Harry's ministry among us. As a call to worship, I'm going to read some verses from Hebrews chapter 10, starting at verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is, his body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us now draw near to God as we sing his praises in our first song, Who Alone Could Save Themselves. Lord, we bow before you, acknowledging and confessing that you are the almighty, only wise God. You are so great. You are not limited. You don't change. You dwell in heaven, and yet you are everywhere in this universe. You are a God of love, creating us in love and redeeming us in love, leading us, nurturing us, 
challenging and disciplining us, preparing us for life in your presence. Truly we cannot save ourselves, but your grace and your love have called us, rescued us, healed us and brought us into your family. We can only say hallelujah for all that you've done for us in Jesus Christ. We would take time at the start of this time of worship to pause and to recognise your greatness, your transcendence, your holiness and your grace towards us as your people. All of this was accomplished by our Lord Jesus Christ who lived as we should have lived and who died to achieve our salvation. All praise and glory be to him. Thank you that he is the source of our salvation, that he loved us enough to die for us and that all that is good in our Christian lives comes from him. As we will reflect on today, he is the vine and we are dependent on him if we wish to be fruitful servants. We acknowledge and confess that we're unworthy of all your favour and love. We rejoice in the salvation you've achieved for us, but we confess our continuing unworthiness, our ongoing sin, which grieves your spirit and stunts our growth as Christians. We need to confess our sins to remind us that all of our Christian lives are sustained by your grace and that we're far from the finished article. Help us to see and to repent of our sin. Please help us never to take it for granted. Please make us more fruitful servants. And yet we thank you that we are a work in progress. You are drawing us on in our Christian lives. And for that we give you thanks and praise. Lord, give us the grace to desire deep in our hearts to live and serve you better. And the will to allow your transforming grace to do its work in us. Today we wish to give you the praise and honour which is your due, our only reasonable sacrifice of praise. And we ask, Lord, that you will be with us, drawing out our worship, speaking your word, inhabiting our praise. Bless your word as Harry preached it to us, and may all that we do be to your praise and glory. In Jesus' great name. Amen. And now, just to explain how the service will unfold, in a minute, Aileen will come to lead us in our family focus, and that will be followed by a children's song. After that, Shona is going to read our passage of scripture for this week, which is John chapter 15, verses 1 to 17. And then Alex is going to come and pray for us and our world. After that, we'll sing again a version of Psalm 40, and then Harry will preach God's word to us. After that, we'll sing our final song, All My Hope on God is Founded, and then I'll come back to round things off and pronounce a benediction. Good morning, everyone. Hi there. Hope you've had a great week and you've been out enjoying the snow. Isn't it exciting? Let me see. Hands up if you've built a snowman this week. Oh, great. Hands up if you've been sledging this week. <gasps> I've been sledging. Great fun. Well done, Jean. You've been out too. That's great. Great fun to be able to enjoy this snow. Well, welcome to Family Focus and today we're continuing to find out who God is. Today we hear that God is judge. I wonder, have you ever said, oh, that's not fair? Or maybe, what? But that's not fair. Or maybe you've looked at somebody else and thought, oh, that's not fair. I'm sure we've all said those words, adults and children alike at some point whether we feel that it's unfair to us or we've seen a situation with someone else and we feel they've been treated unfairly. I've got a little story for you today to try and illustrate this. Thomas and James were playing happily with their Lego. Dad came home with some chocolate donuts. He told the boys that they were a treat for after lunch, so don't eat them just now. James looked longingly at the donuts, mm. but he knew he was not to touch them until after lunch. However, 
The temptation was just too much for Thomas. He dived in and took a big bite from one donut. Just then, they heard Dad coming downstairs. Thomas took his chocolatey fingers, wiped them on James's face and pushed the donut towards him. Dad came in and said, uh, What's happened here? Thomas pointed at James and said, He did it. He had a big bite from that donut. Poor James. Dad was disappointed. No more donuts for you, James. James was so upset. It's not fair. Well, that wasn't very fair, was it? We don't like it when the wrong decision is made. We get in trouble and it wasn't our fault. That's a horrible feeling. Or when other people get away with doing something bad or wrong. We want everything to be fair. Now that was just a story. You're not to worry, everybody did get a donut. There was no trouble. In a courtroom, the judge has the job of deciding who has been in the wrong and who is telling the truth. They've got to look at and listen to evidence and they try to be fair. Our parents, grandparents, teachers are a bit like judges for us sometimes, aren't they? They've got to decide if who's been right or who's wrong if there's been a disagreement. And sometimes they don't get it right. If they weren't actually there to see what actually happened, it can be really difficult. Mark wasn't there to see. Actually, it was Thomas who ate that donut and then blatantly put the blame on James. It was a bit of a rotten trick. Well, the great news is that the Bible tells us that God is judge. Isaiah 33 verse 22. For the Lord is our judge. God is the one who decides what is right and wrong. If you remember, we learned a few weeks ago that God is everywhere. He sees everything, he hears everything, he always knows what is really going on and he doesn't miss anything. Also, God cares about us and about what is right and wrong, so we can trust him to judge fairly. God is judge. He doesn't make mistakes like people do. His decisions are always right. We can listen to and read God's word in the Bible and know that what he says and what he decides is right. That is such good news to hold on to, isn't it? And share it with other people. God is our judge. We're going to pray now and the words will come up on the screen. So if you want to join in with me, that would be great. Dear God, thank you that you are the perfect judge. Thank you that you see and hear everything and that your decisions are always right. Please help us to trust you in all that we do. Help us also to be fair with our friends and family. In Jesus' name, Amen. Sometimes life can get us down Things that happen make us frown Slip on a banana skin Trip and fall into a bin Sometimes we just wonder why Things that happen make us cry We get ill or hurt ourselves But we can always tell each other We can always tell each other God is Sometimes people make us sad Wind us up and make us mad Call us names or pull our hair Laugh about our underwear Sometimes we feel on our own Things that happen make us grow Nothing seems to go our way But we can always tell each other We can always tell each other
bigger, bigger, bigger. Today's reading is from John chapter 15, verses 1 to 17. The vine and the branches. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me also as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you will bear much fruit, apart from me you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do that, what I command. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his father's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the father will give you. This is my command, love each other. As we turn to prayer, let us read the first four verses of Psalm 61, which say, Hear my cry, O God. Listen to my prayer. From the ends of the earth I call to you. I call as my heart grows faint. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been my refuge, a strong tower against the foe. I long to dwell in your tent forever, and take refuge in the shelter of your wings. Lord, it is a great privilege that we know that we can come to you in prayer, to know from your word that you promise us that we shall find rest and shelter in you. Help remind us of your need to call out to you, that if we try to do all things in our own strength, we shall falter, or when we take on too much physically or mentally, we often feel overwhelmed, but if we turn to you, there is the promise of your grace and care to us. Lead us to the higher rock where you will give us refuge and give us the shelter of your wings to shield us from those things that strike against us. As we look at the days behind and ahead of us, we think of those who have been homeschooling. We give thanks for the school holidays, giving parents a break from the schooling routine. As we look ahead to the future weeks, we are cautiously hopeful that schools and nurseries will be able to reopen and welcome children back. We also pray for students and university workers who have also been restricted to studying and working from home, that you would care and look after them. This week has seen the weather bring us lots of snow, and we enjoy the beautiful scenery and seeing children playing, yet it has also it also brings frustration in travelling and for the safety for those who need to go out. So we ask for that safety for all those who need to go to work, 
for getting shopping, for essential trips, trips to the doctor, etc., and all other requirements, that these won't be hindered. We pray for all those who are yet to receive the COVID vaccination as well. Pray that the wait wouldn't be too much longer. And we thank you for these vaccines. And we thank you also for those who are administering the vaccine. We remember and pray keenly for those in care homes or for those who are housebound. You know each of them, their specific worries, fears, health needs, and ask you would pour out your love to them. Those that we know who are in pain or suffering, give them an additional sense of that protection and shelter beneath your wings. Where healing is needed, we ask that it would come swiftly. Where comfort is required, that, the, that this would come in the form of a letter, a phone call or doorstep visit. Help us to think of those that we may not have been in contact with for a while and maybe take steps to rectify that this week. As we think of our church, we want to give thanks for your wise provision as we look ahead to Joe and his family joining us shortly. In particular, we give thanks for all those practical elements of visas, housing, etc. that have come together. And we would now ask that travel arrangements and COVID restrictions wouldn't be unduly problematic. And so we now thank you again for your grace to us. Administer that to us as we listen to your word being preached today. We thank you for these I am statements that we find in John, for all that we learnt so far. And we thank you for Harry and for Bob for preaching, for helping in revealing the message to be found within these words. So as we sit at home, not meeting in our church building as we would wish, and also perhaps thinking of frustrations from lockdown, just help us not to remain fixed upon what we may feel that we have been denied, but instead look upon all that has been freely given, and in that remain joyful. In your name we pray. Amen. Church. 
and a warm welcome to anyone who may be listening for the first time on YouTube. My name is Harry Clayson and uh, this week we are in the last of the I Am Sayings. Now these are sayings of Jesus that are found throughout John's Gospel and so far we've seen that Jesus is the bread of life, we've seen that he is the light of the world, he's the gate, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life. Last week we saw that he is the way, the truth and the life and so this week we are in John chapter 15 and we see that Jesus is the vine. And so if you have a Bible with you, please do open it up at John chapter 15 as we'll be looking at this chapter and verse 5 of that chapter in particular this morning. So in this chapter, Jesus is speaking in what is known as a farewell discourse. Jesus has told his disciples that he is going to leave them and go back to the Father. And of course this refers to his crucifixion, his resurrection and his ascension back to heaven. And so he begins to comfort his disciples. They are clearly troubled by this news. And as Bob told us last week, Jesus says to them, he says to them, do not be troubled in chapter 14. And that's where we saw the last I am saying, which we have looked at. I am the way, the truth and the life. And we saw that last week, didn't we? But then we come to our passage this morning. And Jesus begins to speak of himself as a vine and his disciples as the branches. But before we look at what Jesus says here, it's important to, to bear in mind that these were some of Jesus' final moments with his disciples. Jesus knew what was going to happen shortly and he knew what his disciples would go through, how they would feel and he knew exactly what they needed to know. And so we can be sure that what Jesus says here is vital for those who would follow him. People's final words are usually uh, important and we tend to have a lot of respect for people's final words, don't we? And so we can be sure that what Jesus says here, he chose very carefully. And he, he, he knew that this is what his disciples needed to hear. And he knew that these were his last moments before he was to be betrayed. And so, whilst there's a lot to consider in these verses, we're going to focus mainly on verse 5. But all that we see, bear in mind that Jesus said this, knowing that soon he would be away from his disciples. And so this is vital that they would hear it, and for us as Christians, that we would hear it this morning. And so... This is what it says, verse 5 of John chapter 15. It says, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Today there are many self-help books, aren't there? If you go to Waterstones or W.H. Smith, no doubt there's whole sections devoted to these books. And this, this way of thinking has even crept into the Christian world too, where we find books titled such as Live Your Best Life Now, or The Key to True Contentment, or even Finding God's Purpose for Your Life. And yet from this verse and the, the one surrounding it, we see that God's purpose for us as Christians is that we bear fruit. And we also see the key to this fruitfulness. As we will go on to see, we don't need a self-help book, but we need Jesus. And so there are three things that I want us to look at in this sermon. The first is that we see Jesus is divine. We see that union with him leads to fruitfulness. And thirdly, we see that apart from him, we are fruitless. And so firstly then, Jesus is the vine. With some of the previous I'm sayings, we see that Jesus says the same metaphor twice within the passage. And we see the same thing here. So in verse 1, he says, I'm the true vine and my father 
is the gardener. And then here in verse 5, we see him call himself a vine again, doesn't he? When he says, I'm a vine and you are the branches. And so what did Jesus mean when he said that he is a vine? And well, I believe there are two aspects to this saying. The first is that Jesus is claiming to be the fulfilment of the vine imagery that is used in the Old Testament. And the second is that Jesus is using this image of a vine to teach the disciples a key truth. And that truth is that in order to be fruitful Christians, they need to remain in him. In order to live the Christian lives that he wants them to live after his departure, they need to remain in him. So by Jesus calling himself the vine, and indeed the true vine, as we see in verse 1, we see that he is claiming to be the vine which has replaced the one referred to in the Old Testament. And of course, this is the first aspect that I'm speaking of. We see throughout the Old Testament that, that, that the nation of Israel is likened to a vine that did not bear the fruit which God desired. Israel was supposed to be a light to the nations. But instead they became like them. They went after their false gods. And so numerous times God uses his vine imagery to highlight their failure in fulfilling their calling. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 7 says this. It says, the vineyard of the Lord Almighty is the nation of Israel. And the people of Judah are the vines he delighted in. And he looked for justice but saw bloodshed for righteousness but heard cries of distress. And then in Psalm 80, verse 8, we read this. It says, You transplanted a vine from Egypt. You drove out the nations and planted it. And a few verses later in that chapter, in, in that chapter Psalm 80, it says, Your vine is cut down. It is burned with fire. At your rebuke, your people perish. You see, Israel was supposed to be the vine, but they failed to bear fruit. And each time it resulted in God's displeasure and judgment. And so when Jesus says that he is the vine, we cannot miss what he is saying. He's saying that he is the true Israel. It is only through him that salvation is found. There is still a place for the, the Jewish people, but that place is only in Jesus. It is only found in him and through him. They failed to bear the desired fruit, but Jesus didn't. And never will. But the second and more obvious meaning to what Jesus is saying in this passage here. Is that by him being a vine. He's saying that he is a source of spiritual life and vigour for his people. In Israel uh, vineyards were a common sight. And the image of a vine would have been a familiar one to his disciples as they listened to him saying this. So when Jesus said that he is the vine and that they are the branches, they would have known exactly what Jesus meant. Jesus is the source of all they need to bear fruit. All the sap, it comes from the trunk of the vine, doesn't it? And it goes to the branches. And in the same way, it is only in Jesus that this life-giving, fruit-producing power is to be found. Just as the heart is seen as the life source for the human body. If the heart stops, life stops. And it's because the heart pumps the blood around the rest of the body, doesn't it? And in the same way, Jesus is divine and without him the believer has no life. But the metaphor goes even deeper. Because it's not just life that Jesus has in view here, but the ability to bear fruit. With the life that the vine gives comes the fruit. And this leads on to the second point, which is union with Jesus leads to fruit. So we've seen that Jesus is the vine, and now we see that union with Jesus, who is the vine, leads to fruit for the branches. When Jesus says that he is the vine and we are the branches, he's showing the vital need there is for the Christian to remain in and united to Jesus. Just as a branch needs 
the trunk for life. So the believer needs Jesus. The imagery really shows the closeness there is between the believer and their Lord. We see this elsewhere, don't we, when Jesus is called the head and the church the body. When we become a Christian, we become united to Jesus through faith and by the Spirit. And so Christ dwells within us through the Holy Spirit, which is why the Apostle Paul can call the Holy Spirit the Spirit of Christ in Romans chapter 8. And the result of this union is fruit bearing. And that is the crux of the matter. The whole reason why Jesus is saying this is because he wants his disciples to bear fruit when he is gone. By fruit we can take the whole scope of biblical meaning from the fruits of the Spirit. So the disciples will be more loving and kind and patient and self-controlled. To meaning that if they remain in Jesus they will be fruitful in their witness as they fulfill the great commission as they go and make disciples of all nations and so it's like Jesus is giving his disciples the instruction manual on how to be fruitful as Christians I'm sure numerous books have been written on this topic on how to bear fruit as Christians but really all they need to say is remain in Jesus Stay attached to him, abide in him, keep looking to him and trusting in him. This is what Jesus is saying when he means, when he, this is what Jesus means when he says in our verse, remain in me. He's saying, stay fixed on me. If you want to grow in holiness, if you want to become more loving, more patient with your children, more effective in your gospel witness and more joyful in your Christian life, if you want to become like me in your character, Remain in me. Keep reading my word. Keep casting yourself upon me. Keep praying. And above all, keep believing. And as we see from chapter, from verse 2 of our chapter, fruit is God's will for his children. So much so that in order for them to bear fruit, God prunes us just as a farmer would cut back his grapevine so that in the next harvest it will bear more fruit again. God lets trials come our way so that we may grow in even more Christ-likeness. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 3, it confirms that, that, that fruit is God's will when it says this. It says, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. We could say that sanctification means to be progressively made more and more holy or Christ-like. So for the Bible to say that God's will is that you should be sanctified is basically saying that it is God's will that you would bear more and more fruit by becoming more and more like Jesus. It's like when you plant a seed in the ground, whether it's a flower or a tomato plant, you expect it to grow. And to flower or to produce fruit. That is the whole purpose as to why you planted the seed. Your desire for the plant is fruitfulness. And it's the same with God and the believer. God desires fruitfulness. And just like there are certain guidelines for producing fruit on a plant, such as giving it water, ensuring it's planted in good soil where it gets plenty of sunlight, so there are guidelines to be followed as Christians that we may bear more fruit. And this is it. Remain in Jesus. Rankin Wilborn in his book Union with Christ is helpful when he writes this. He says union with Christ is not an abstract idea. It is a powerful reality. And if Jesus has joined his life to yours then you have been given everything you need for life and godliness. So by being united to Jesus through faith, we will live fruit-bearing godly lives. And this also goes to show that fruit-bearing is the sign of someone who is united to Jesus. Jesus himself confirms this 
in verse 8 of our passage when he says, This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. It is fruit that shows that we are Christians and that is because those who are united to Jesus have been made new by the Spirit of God. The Holy Spirit dwells in them and is conforming them to the image of Christ. The good work that God begins, he brings to completion. And so fruit is not only a necessity, but it is also a certainty. It is a certainty for the one who is united to Jesus. And now, of course, there will be varying degrees of fruit. And we are all at different stages in the sanctification process. But wherever we are on this journey, the sign of the Christian is that growth will be taking place. And change has not only happened, but is happening. Think about it. How can someone have the Holy Spirit living within them and be united to Jesus and yet not be changed? So fruit is necessary, but we, we must always come back to this very point. The point that Jesus is making in our passage. That it is only through him that we can bear fruit. Of course there is human responsibility and we have choices to make. We need to make our calling and election sure. And we need to work out our salvation as God works within us. But it is only made possible by remaining in Jesus. It is the power of the gospel and God working within us that enables us to live holy lives and to be changed. It is only by being attached to the vine that we as the branches can bear fruit. But maybe you're listening this morning and you're thinking, I don't need Jesus to be a good person. I don't hurt other people and I'm a pretty decent person. And well, that may be true to a certain degree, but without Jesus, it is impossible to bear the fruit that God looks for. We may be good according to human standards, but when we use God's measuring line, we see that without Christ, we are not good at all, but rather we are sinners in need of a saviour. We are dead branches cut off from the living vine, which is why Jesus says in the final part of our verse, Apart from me, you can do nothing. And this brings us to the third point that we see in our passage. And that is that without Jesus, we are fruitless. Without Jesus, we are fruitless. Because if union leads to fruit, then a lack of union with Christ leads to no fruit at all. And in fact, Jesus is even more explicit in verse 4 of our chapter when he says this. It's the verse just before the verse we're focusing on this morning. He says, No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. So contrary to popular opinion, no. No one is good apart from Jesus. The Bible teaches that without Jesus we are dead in our sin, separated from God and under his just condemnation. Our hearts are not right before God and the Bible leaves us without a doubt on this. This is what we read in Romans chapter 3 verses 10 to 18. It says, There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have, come, they have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways and the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Those words, no one and all, 
include each one of us. And so it is only through Jesus that this can be changed. If we take seriously the words of Jesus here in this chapter, in chapter 15 of John, then we will not disagree with this statement. It would be absurd to believe that you could snap off a branch from an apple tree and yet still expect that branch to produce apples. Even though it's been cut off from its life source and it's dead. But Jesus goes even further, doesn't he? And he doesn't just say that these branches are dead. But in fact, because of this lack of fruit, which results in being cut off from the vine, there is nothing that these branches are good for other than to be thrown into the fire. And this is exactly what he says in verse 6. He says, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. So those are the two options really that are being presented to each one of us this morning. Union with Jesus or judgment. And now on the face of it, this verse seems to suggest that unless a Christian pulls their weight, they will lose their salvation and go to hell. But I'm convinced otherwise. And that's because the Bible so strongly teaches that a Christian, a true Christian, who's been made alive in Christ by the Holy Spirit, someone who is truly trusting in Jesus to save them from their sin, that they cannot lose their salvation. The Bible teaches in John chapter 6 that God has given a people to Jesus and those people can never be lost. Jesus will raise them up at the last day. In Romans chapter 8, we are told that nothing can separate us from Jesus' love. And the Bible verses which teach these truths could be multiplied over and over. And so if the Christian cannot lose their salvation, what does this verse mean? Well, these branches are false converts. Take Judas, for example. He had everyone fooled, everyone except Jesus. They were fooled into thinking that he was the real deal. And then he went to betray Jesus and killed himself. There were false converts then and there are false converts today. People who profess Christ but bear no fruit. And in the end, they fall away. They are those who John writes about in his first epistle. He says they went out from us, but they did not really belong to us. For if they had belonged to us, they would have remained with us. But their going showed that none of them belonged to us. The branches that are attached to the vine bear fruit. And those who are not attached to the vine are fruitless. Those that bear fruit through union with Christ go to heaven. And those that are fruitless go to hell. But the deciding factor is not the fruit. The deciding factor is whether they are united to Jesus and not the fruit. It is the union which results in the fruit, or the lack of union that results in the fruitlessness. In other words, the fruit does not cause the union, but the union, the fruit. And it's important to remember that the fruit does not add or keep a Christian salvation. It is purely the consequence and the, the natural result of being saved. But as Jesus teaches here, there must be fruit. There must be holiness, righteousness. So the exhortation of Peter to the church still rings in our ears. Make every effort to confirm your calling and election. In other words, do you believe in Jesus? Have you turned to him for forgiveness of your sin? Fruit is a sign that someone is attached to the vine, but we don't look to our fruit to see if we're a Christian. We look to Jesus and make sure that we're trusting in him alone to save us. There's a fine line 
between seeing our fruit as a consequence of being made alive in Christ and thinking that good living automatically makes us a Christian. May we not look to ourselves this morning, but look to Jesus, the one who can save to the uttermost those who come to him. But let it be said that if you are fruitless this morning, as you hear this sermon and yet you profess the name of Jesus, then take heed to his warning found in these verses concerning the dead branches and flee to him. And if you are here and you've never even professed Jesus and you know you're a dead branch this morning and you are concerned for your soul, flee to Jesus. Call upon him to save you this morning, to take away your sin. It is only by his death and resurrection that sinners can be forgiven before God. Jesus is your only hope. Believe in him this morning. And for the living branches, remain in the vine. Remain in the vine. Keep believing in Jesus. Keep looking to Jesus and you shall bear fruit. In fact, remaining in in the vine is the very essence of our salvation because without union with Christ we are lost and cut off from God. John Calvin the 16th century church reformer he hits the nail on the head when he writes this in his institutes. He says we must now examine this question how do we receive those benefits which the father bestowed on his only begotten son not for Christ's own private use, but that he might enrich poor and needy men. First, we must understand that as long as Christ remains outside of us and we are separated from him, all that he has suffered and done for the salvation of the human race remains useless and of no value for us. Therefore, to share with us what he has received from the Father he had to become ours to dwell within us. For this reason he is called our head and the firstborn among many brethren. We also in turn are said to be engrafted into him and to put on Christ. For as I have said, all that he possesses is nothing to us until we grow into one body with him. It is true that we obtain this by faith. So John Calvin is saying there that without union with Christ, without being attached to him through faith, all that he's achieved is nothing to us because it is not ours. We cannot benefit from the death and resurrection of Christ as long as we are outside of him. It is union with Christ that not only enables us to be fruitful Christians, but it makes us Christians in the first place. So as I finish, may we seek that union with all our hearts and ensure that we have it, that we have this union with Christ, for it is our only hope in life and death. If you want to be a fruitful Christian, remain in Christ. Keep looking to him. But in order for anyone to be saved, we need to be united to him. And may we all ensure that is true of us this morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word. And for the opportunity we have to look at your word and to study it together, Father. And I just pray that you will help each of us to be united to Jesus. Those of us who have experienced your working power within us, who have been made alive by your spirit and united to Jesus, help us to keep looking to him, to remain in him. Keep working in us by your spirit, we pray. And help us to be fruitful Christians, living lives that glorify you and honour you. And Father, for any listening who know nothing of a union with Jesus, I just pray, Lord, that you will do a work of grace in their lives. 
that you'll draw them to the Saviour and Lord that they'll be found in him. Be with us Lord for the rest of the day and into the week Father we pray. Help us to live God glorifying lives in Jesus name. service before we finish i would like to specifically and specially thank harry for his ministry among us these past few weeks it's been a great joy and a great benefit to us to have harry preach to us and uh, we want to give him thanks for all his time and efforts and we're sure that the lord will use this for our benefit as we close i'd like to give you a couple of verses from first peter chapter 5 and the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm and steadfast. To him be the power for ever and ever. Amen. <laughs>